What's up, guys? Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House. And my guest today is Ronald Stofferly, the author of In Gold We Trust and the managing partner at Incrementum. Uh, I love talking to Ronnie. This was super fun. I really hope you enjoy it. He just got back from, from two conferences in, in Denver, the Denver Gold Show and, and Beaver Creek, two big precious metals conferences. So I loved picking his brain on investor sentiment, CEO sentiment, all that stuff. We spent a lot of time talking about geopolitical power balances from his perspective, uh, the future of gold, the future of Bitcoin, cash, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, super fun. I really hope you enjoyed this one. Three things before we jump in. Number one, there's a pinned comment beneath this video where you can sign up for my weekly newsletter. It's free. I'd love to have you join the team. Number two, uh, when I launched this YouTube channel, I didn't expect to make any advertising revenue. Coincidentally, I do now, which is great. What I've decided to do with that cash is donate it to an organization called Zero Ceiling, which is super close to my heart. Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by giving urban at-risk youth the opportunity to relocate to a beautiful wilderness area, providing them with supportive housing, employment training, and just great influences on their life. I was a big benefactor of my time spent in wild places at a young age. It actually transformed me remarkably for the better. And I'd love to be able to pass this forward. Zero Ceiling's awesome. Check them out if you want to. Number three, if you'd prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can now find me wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. All right, here's Ronald Stofferly. Enjoy. I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation. And that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm joined right now by Ronald Stofferly, the author of In Gold We Trust and managing partner at Incrementum. Ronnie, how are you? Hi, Jay. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, you're fresh back from uh, Beaver Creek Conference in Colorado, the Denver Gold Show in Colorado. I uh, wasn't able to make it. Um, you know, where I'd love to start, therefore, Ronnie, is like, you must have sat down with, I don't know, 80 or so uh, precious metals companies met with tons of investors, tons of delegates at the events. Talk to me about about sentiment right now. What are you seeing uh, from investors in the space and and company CEOs in the space? Uh, well, I, I tweeted out something. Uh, I basically retweeted um, one thing from from the Denver Gold Show where there was one guy with a suitcase um, leaving basically an empty huge haul and that happened at at the denver gold show so so actually you know um i would say attendance was was very very slow okay. um i think for the precious metal summit for example there were like 500 people in person while uh two or three years three years ago i think there were like two thousand people attending um of course um there were lots of virtual meetings but from my point of view both conferences, Denver Gold and Precious Metals, were really, really um, well worth the trip. Um, and it hasn't been easy to, to, to go over to the United States, so I had to apply for a national interest exemption. Um, so I think President Biden had to sign off directly that <laughs> to allow me to come over to the US, but I made it. And, 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 and I think, you know, Jay, um, one of the things that I realized at the conference was that there were only people that really wanted to attend, that really wanted to make business, that wanted to talk to to companies, to find new uh, investment ideas, to to meet up with uh, with old friends. So 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 actually, the quality of meetings was was excellent, and those people that attend the conference is mostly because of the uh, the the drinks receptions. Um, yeah, they weren't there, but but mm. I really enjoyed it and. And, and for me, I, I gave the first um, big keynote in person in almost two years, which, which was really a very, very good feeling. So I, I did like 80 meetings with companies and, uh, and, I, and I would say that most companies really did a, did a great job over the last couple of, uh, uh, of quarters. Um, we're seeing, you know, companies focusing on, on, on organic growth, uh, delivering free cash flow, raising dividends, buying back shares. Um, I think political risk was, was definitely a topic that we discussed uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. 
some some cost pressure for example for various materials but also for 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 drilling expenses finding skilled labor those were topics um many companies that that i wasn't um too excited about they they try to um talk primarily about uh esg um to you know to to make up for the mm. <laughs> for the mistakes that they that they've made in their in their primary business but but in general i would say that out of those 80 meetings i would say um 65 were really really surprisingly positive that's pretty okay that's a that's a good number yeah. you know i uh, you you kind of gave me a flashback when you talked about uh, it being maybe a bit quiet on the floor. However, those that were there, they meant business, you know, and it, it, the reason it gave me a flashback is because, as you know, you know, I run a, a series of investment conferences, handful in the precious metal sector. And from call it like 2013 through to 2017, maybe, maybe even earlier, 2012 to 20, 2017, it was, it was pretty dire straits out there. And we'd be hosting events and very little attendance. And we'd always say, but if they're here in this market, they mean business, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so given that I've heard that narrative before, and back then the macro forces weren't at play that were so supportive of a gold narrative. So it was almost like we were trying to talk ourselves up, like, look, it's pretty bleak out there. But at least the people that are here are here to write checks. You know, if they're coming to a, a gold market in 2015, they mean business. But it's different today, right? Because there's all kinds of supporting macro trends for the gold narrative. Gold market hasn't really responded yet. But but what do you make of that, Ronnie? Well, you know, I, th I think when it comes to flows, f first of all, we shouldn't forget that um, um the the pretty slow attendance was was of course not only due to um the the weak performance of the mining stocks but also of course due to covid so so yeah. many many bankers had to cancel their trips very short notice many companies couldn't attend so so many investors also said well you know it doesn't make any sense to go there to then do a virtual meeting i can do that from home as well mm -hmm. um so so i think the that's that's definitely uh, an important factor but but uh, you know i talked to many other fund managers and everybody basically said well we don't see any inflows most most of the fund managers actually of the long only gold mining uh, uh funds they they see some outflows um generalists are not really um joining the party or the party i mean uh it's, it's not a party yet um but but i didn't see too many generalist investors coming in um although valuations now really really are appealing and 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 you know you see um single digit pe's you see um uh, dividend yields at three to four partly five percent so it's 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 really um i think from a from a value investor point of view i think there's there's many many gems to be found in this in this industry at the moment um when it comes to gold and of course uh i think um we 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 won't see um, gold mining stocks or silver mining stocks uh, really um, um, diverging from um, uh, from from a lackluster um, gold and silver price. So 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 without gold and silver going higher, I don't see. I cannot make a, a strong case for for a big bull market in the mining space. Obviously, however. Um, I think sentiment wise, you know, I talked at the precious metal summit, for example, um, to a diehard gold bug, um, and, and, and he asked me, well, do you think, what do you think is gold dead? And I said, I don't think so. Actually, I can really imagine that, that gold will, will go to new all time highs over the next couple of months. And he said, no way that this is impossible. Gold is dead. So if you see this um this 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 pessimism already in the sector people that that are really into gold that that uh love their gold i think that that's that's quite telling mm. and you know now we're we're trading uh slightly below 1800 
actually it doesn't take too much to go to new all-time highs but of course i mean i'm i'm not super excited about the uh, uh, price developments uh over the last couple of months but we shouldn't get too greedy gold was up 26 percent uh last year it was up uh, i think 15 percent the year before year to date in us dollar terms we are down i think six or seven percent so it's mm -hmm. it's not that bad and again companies uh, are, are delivering they are, they are producing record record amounts of free cash flow so so um it makes me pretty pretty confident i would say yeah that's really interesting the conversation you had with somebody that you described as a diehard gold bug who is telling you that sorry ronnie gold is dead and isn't that it's it's interesting i had a similar conversation on uh, two days ago with a, a a peer of mine in in youtube land right he runs a channel like mine and i uh, sort of a peer and we share notes in our portfolios every couple of months uh his core focus is cryptocurrencies however you know he does invest in precious metals and some other stuff but he was grilling me because he said jay like if gold isn't performing in this market right with all these supporting factors maybe the narrative is over maybe that story is over and similar to you i was like this is great news I, that's the most bullish thing i've heard um in the gold sector and, and i i take your story the same way i mean that's it's uh it's difficult to be a contrarian investor it's really really hard right it, it takes a, a lot of a lot of balls like to step out when everyone else is running away but uh all of my mentors in the space that's when they acted and um, you know, I want to I want to pull up a Rick Rule quote that I just love so much. He called me in in March of 2020 when the sky was falling and said, he said, uh, Jay, it's times like these when the rest of the world is on the ground in the fetal position. That's when you have to kick the door down and storm the room, right? And I love it, right? But he's right, yeah. and he's built a career off that advice. And I think you know that the combination of extremely negative sentiment, no interest in the sector at all, and pretty positive fundamentals that's that's something that i like and you know um my wife for example you know she she always buys the christmas decoration N not in november or in december she buys it in january when it's 50 percent off so <laughs> she's right. she, she's a contra contrarian and and actually in 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 our funds we're currently uh we're constantly buying we've got some stink bits uh in the market so 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 i like this current environment and you know the big question is of course what is it going to take to 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 make gold move again and i think you know i think the biggest opportunity <clears throat> costs um first of all are in the um uh, you know, on the equity side um as long as uh, us equity markets just um roar from one one all-time high to another um i think this this will give gold a hard time however over the last couple of days we saw um some volatility back again and and actually gold was one of the very very few assets that did really well so so my thesis is always that that gold has this enormous amount of of intuition of, of 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 intelligence because you know the price of gold is influenced by so many different factors so many different um buyers and sellers from all over the globe so i think there's quite a lot of um uh wisdom actually the wisdom of the crowds in the price of gold so i think that um perhaps um it is discounting that tapering is happening it's gonna happen sooner or later and and i think the whole um you know the 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 the, the whole discussion in markets when does it start i think this is it, it is kind of getting a little bit boring that's like the alcoholic um that tells us that well you know in five months from now i'll drink one glass of bourbon less per day mm -hmm. um and at some point you know I will only drink half a bottle uh, uh, a day anymore. I think, you know, that the price of gold really, it hates this whole um, uncertainty. I think once we've got a date regarding tapering, I think this should be a positive driver. Then, as I've said, um, opportunity costs uh, coming from the equity side, but then also cryptos. Um, as you know, Jay, we've got two funds that actually combine uh, uh, Bitcoin and and gold, another one with cryptocurrencies and mining stocks. And 
and we actually love the volatility of the, of the Bitcoin space. We 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 embrace the volatility by by writing options. Um, but but it is obvious that when it comes to you know talking to journalists, um, they don't care about gold at the moment. They they want to sell their their stories. And yeah. obviously, writing about Bitcoin and the whole DeFi space that's much more exciting for them. And and of course, that's that's what people want to read about at the moment. Yeah, and that's the business of media, which I think is so important to recognize. As you said, they're in the business of selling stories, right? So they'll yep. publish headlines and all, whatever's going to generate the click because that yeah. picks the ad revenue. And that's the business model. And, and losing sight of that can be disastrous if you think you're getting uh, unbiased information when really it's it's sensationalism is what sells, right? And so exactly, let's sell them what they want. In this case, in this case it might be crypto. Um, yeah, okay, I lo love all that. You know, I, I definitely uh, subscribe to um, Nassim Taleb's thesis that nothing stress tests as, effect as effectively as time. And, you know, I wouldn't call myself a gold bug by any stretch. Uh, however, I, I hold a lot of gold equities and gold. And that's just because I can't ignore the past, right? You look at the, the our past, you know, we're not talking about 13 years, we're not talking about 100 years, right? You got to look deeper than that. And uh, I absolutely always I think if you study history and pay attention to currencies, I don't under understand how you would not have a position in the gold sector in some way, shape or form. Um, but that is what it is. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about uh, Denver a little bit because this was, as you said, it was the first keynote address that you gave in two years, yep. right? So yeah. what, what did you tell people, Ronnie? Uh, <laughs> well, it, it, it was called the monetary tipping point. So basically, um, I, I, I talked about the book, the brilliant book, um, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. So, so it basically describes that, that magic moment when an idea, a trend or a social behavior um, crosses a, a certain threshold, tips and then spreads like a wildfire. And, you know, just as a single, as a single sick person or, or a bat can uh, start an epidemic of the flu, so too can a, can a, small but pre precisely targeted push cause cause a new fashion trend but we're also seeing those tipping points not only in sociology but also in physics in finance and in history and i think that when it comes to um tipping points in finance actually that that the COVID crisis was was really the tipping point um that is changing this long-standing dynamic from a disinflationary environment, uh, you know, the great moderation um, to an inflationary uh, environment. Jay, obviously, you know, inflation is a topic again. And, 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 and I think, you know, in our last In Gold We Trust report, we, we wrote extensively about uh, uh, inflation, why it's changing. Um, so, so, so I think people get that we are seeing very, very strong monetary um monetary stimulus but i think what many people tend to forget at the moment is that actually fiscal stimulus is is is, is becoming much much more important than uh, than monetary stimulus so so i'm i'm asking the question what if central banks are becoming increasingly irrelevant what if the days of monetary policy being the driving force are actually over because we have seen this shift from monetary to fiscal dominance. We know that the toolbox of central bankers is basically largely exhausted. And if you look at what happened since the COVID crisis, it is absolutely clear that now we will use in, 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 in every crisis um, that's coming in the future, um, that fiscal stimulus and direct measures will become much more important than in the past. So um, I, I quote Andy Haldane, the, the outgoing chief economist of the Bank Engl of England, and he wrote a, a very interesting article and, and he basically said that the Bank of England for the years after the Second World War the Bank of England was effectively a think tank and that the government did set interest rates. And from my point of view, and, and Andy Haldane uh, confirms that, we could actually go back to that. So, so I think that the power 
of central banks is slipping away at the moment. And that was basically the, the core topic of, of my speech, where I made the case for, um, um, you know, why fiscal policy is becoming the driving force, what other things are becoming more and more important. This uh, opronomics, basically going direct, everyone gets a bailout, helicopter style policies, MMT style policies, credit guarantees by the government, universal basic income, stuff like that. And of course, um, this wage price spiral that, that is really starting to spin at the moment. So those were um, basically the topics that I, that I talked about. Interesting. Okay. So uh, that's, that's fascinating. So talk to me a little bit more about, about central banks losing control. I want to understand this better, Ronnie, from the standpoint of of who gains the influence as the central banks lose it? Well, well, I mean, I, I think that um, the traditional toolbox of a central banker, um, you know, what did they do prior to prior to the great financial crisis? Of course, um, lowering and increasing uh, interest rates. So that's that's basically uh done i think the um the experiments going into negative territory they, they didn't work so well i don't think that the federal reserve will introduce negative rates we are basically and that was the title of our last book we are in the zero interest rate trap then of course unconventional policies like quantitative easing they are now conventional policies but we see that 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 we're um experiencing this um, um uh, enormous decline uh, of the marginal utility of quantitative easing so okay. now we're seeing uh, 120 billion a month it doesn't really move the needle so so of course uh, at some point i think the federal reserve will start buying uh, uh, equities at some point i think we will see some sort of a uh, yield curve control which would basically be unlimited quantitative easing but but i think that um the market has now really really seen that um the emperor has no clothes and that at some point um you know central bankers um they, they don't run the show anymore. And on the other hand, I think that politicians really, you know, they, they enjoy the fact that, that they can um, um, intervene and, 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 and rescue the economies. And, and we're seeing that the best times of the frugal Swabian housewife are basically a thing of the past so austerity is out all over the world and and i don't think that we will go back to to the regime that we saw before the COVID crisis and you know now mm. normally um i think the, the 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 thing is that um of course the debt mountains already before the COVID crisis were, were pretty high. And we know that, um, that uh, now the sensitivity to rising interest rates is higher than ever. So it is basically impossible for central banks to raise interest rates. I mean, we all know that, but I think now it's really time to focus much, much more on fiscal policies and i mentioned uh one example uh my my dear friend russell napier um um actually highlighted that it is the rise of government credit guarantees and you know russell napier is is, is so important for me as as some sort of a mentor because russell has been a deflationist for decades but now he predicts uh sustained uh sustained inflation so he gave the example of the uk chancellor introducing government guarantees on mortgages up to 600,000 um, pounds, which was announced in the March 2021 budget. So these schemes offer direct incentives for banks to increase lending. And, and actually the risk associated with, with defaults are passed on to, to the society. So 
if there there are um, uh, credit guarantees by the government, and I think we're we're seeing this trend all over the globe. This is really a fundamental change in the way that money is created. So, so there's quite a lot going on, and and therefore, you know, people shouldn't just focus on on monetary growth. We should focus more on fiscal measures. We should focus more on those credit guarantees. I think there's really quite a lot happening, and you know, let's face it, Jay. Um, after the great financial crisis, um, central bankers um, um, basically told us for more than 10 years, inflation rates are too low. Inflation rates are too low. We have to do more to get inflation rates up. Now they are uh, up significantly. Now they keep telling us, well, it's transitory. It will come back. They, they introduced average inflation targeting basically as an excuse for inflation rates to overshoot. Mm -hmm. So it is happening, but still the majority of investors, especially institutional players, they still believe that it's transitory. At some point, I think they will wake up. And, you know, we crunched the numbers in our last in gold we trust report and, and analyzed what actually has the highest inflation beta. And it's, it's pretty simple. It's commodities and it's gold. Yes. Okay. Got it. And I think, tell, tell me if you think I'm wrong here, Ronnie, a lot of the uh, disagreement about the inflation thesis comes down to definitions, timelines, uh, and, and semantics, to be honest. Like, yeah. you know, I sit down with a lot of deflationists because I want to understand both sides of any argument and, um, and they're compelling on either side, you know, um, to the tune of, well, any, any industry that is eventually, um, disrupted by technology becomes deflationary, right? We can look at yeah. any technology based service. I mean, media is the obvious example, uh, music and movies, but th there's plenty more to be honest. And, and things like 3D composite printing are going to disrupt a lot of, yeah. uh, sectors in the same way. And that stuff's not far away anymore. So sector by sector, these things will fall to deflationary pressures from technology disruption. Think about that. Tell me if you think I'm right or wrong and, and so forth. And then I think where the other place I see the discrepancy is in the timeline, right? So it's like transitory. What does transitory mean? Does that mean six months? Does that mean three years? Right. And we couldn't, we, if you don't agree on that, then you could debate all day long, whether or not it is transitory. What, what do you think? Well, you know, talking about deflation, obviously, if, if, if there would be some sort of a laissez-faire approach, so basically nobody would intervene, um, the natural state of our system is deflationary. Okay. Um, absolutely crystal clear, and there is still deflationary forces at work. But my view is that the inflationary forces are now stronger than the deflationary forces. Um, so if there wouldn't be massive fiscal stimulus, if there wouldn't be massive monetary stimulus, then I think it would absolutely be highly deflationary mm. and every credit collapse and what we're seeing in China now, this, those are deflationary trends that we're seeing. However, in our monetary system, we cannot allow any deflation when you're highly in debt yeah deflation is the very very last thing that you want to see yeah so mm -hmm. so i think it, it is really you have to to understand the system and then you 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 you, you start realizing why actually politicians and central bankers are so scared of deflation uh, and the higher you are indebted um, the higher your fear regarding deflation. So I think it is, is absolutely bogus that, um, you know, the mainstream argument, um, we shouldn't go to deflation because, you know, then um, people just stop consuming. I mean, mm. I don't know, it doesn't work too well in the technology technology space where everything is getting cheaper and and the the, the quality uh, of products is getting better people still buy their iPhones their TV sets whatever um, so so my 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 reply was in our monetary system deflation cannot be accepted and the second thing you know regarding the timeline yes first of all uh, inflation is a process. Um, secondly, there are large time lags involved. And thirdly, I think one of the main reasons why, um, why inflation isn't a bigger concern yet is the sharp fall in the velocity of money. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have a look at the long term chart of the velocity of money in 1933 and in 46, velocity was at similarly low levels. And in both cases, 
the U.S. had to um, resort to radical measures. You know, in '34, we all know it, it, it devalued the U.S. dollar versus gold um, by almost 70 percent. And in the period from '46 till uh, '51, they basically kept interest rates uh, at a at a low level. So basically, yield curve control was implemented. Now we are at similarly low levels. And at some point, um, I think that. Be the yield curve control, um, be it um, perhaps even, um, let's say, a realignment of our monetary system. Stuff like that will happen. And, and, and I think over the last couple of quarters, those scenarios clearly became um, 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 more realistic again. And, you know, I, I just finished reading the book Three Days at Camp David. It's a fantastic book. Uh, um, it is how a secret meeting in 1971 transformed the global economy. So, so basically, you know, those fine gentlemen meeting up at Camp David, Richard Nixon, Arthur Burns, uh, Paul Volcker, uh, Kissinger, and so on. Mm. And it perfectly describes what, what happened prior to the 15th of August, 1971. And, and I think, you know, for everybody interested in that space, it's, it's a great read. Uh, and it also shows you the importance uh, of gold and 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 what a big decision it was to temporarily um, uh, to temporarily uh, uh, um, 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 stop the convertibility uh, of the U.S. dollar into gold. So mm. so I think at some point we will see a Camp David event. Um, I think then gold will play a major role. And and as um, the blogger Fofoa said, I think one one revaluation of gold in a lifetime is clearly enough. Uh, and that's my, my longer term scenario. And as I've said, I think we we got much closer to 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 those uh, things um, due to the events uh, that we saw over the last couple of quarters. Interesting. Okay. Three days at Camp David. Thank you for that share. Um, now, another trend I'm curious about is, are you seeing a shift? You know, we've been on this globalization uh, trajectory for my entire life anyways. And do you feel like that is shifting now to uh, us reversing to some sort of a de-globalization -global um, path? And if so, does that add inflationary pressure because we're not getting um, cost efficiencies in terms of labor and, and products and manufacturing, etc. Well, obviously, I think we, we we are seeing that that geopolitical tensions are are rising. You know, on of course with the U.S. and its allies on the one hand, and China and Russia on the other. Um, of course, these tensions could reduce the volume of, of international trade. They could result in less international division of labor, in, in lower economic uh, efficiency, and also in rising consumer prices. But I think that's that's also a big process. I, I, I showed a picture from the last um, summit between China and uh, and the US, and it took place in Alaska. And I think that's, that's also quite a symbolic character. So the atmosphere was extremely chilly, almost hostile. We saw at the G7 meeting afterwards that China now is really, really the big enemy. We saw, of course, um, the recent upheaval in, in, in Afghanistan and, 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 you know, the whole region is kind of a powder keg. And we also saw um, right afterwards that China basically told the whole Asian world, well, you know, it seems that, that the U.S. doesn't have your back anymore and, and um, that, that we're here from you. So, so those are definitely interesting developments, Jay. But we're also seeing, I think, when it comes back to the inflationary trends in the real economy, we're seeing in many parts of, <coughs> sorry, of, of Asia, and also obviously in Australia, we're seeing um, a zero COVID policy. We, we we saw partial close downs in in many of the most important ports um, in Asia, especially in China. Due to some 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 smaller COVID nineteen outbreaks, we saw that shipping rates are going through the roof. Um, we we see and we've we've got uh, one one great client. He he's the owner of a shipping company, and he told us, well, it's gonna take at least eighteen months to mm -hmm. go back to normal. Mm -hmm. So 
so I think it's 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 really a combination of many many different factors that are now coming together, um, and and I think it, it it it's really it will really be be hard to to contain um, the the inf inflation genie now that it's really out of the bottle. So mm. so I think you know just uh, as anecdotal evidence, you know just just walking around in the U.S., uh, I saw we are hiring signs everywhere. I talked to many business owners. They said, well, it's it's really hard to get uh, to get people. Um, good people. We are paying decent salaries, much much higher than than pre-COVID. Uh, in Colorado, it seemed that everybody uh, in the service industry is completely stoned, um, yeah. which isn't too much fun when you're ordering something and only fifty percent <laughs> actually uh, arrive at your table. So 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 I think it's it, it's really um, this wage price spiral really starts spinning now, and it's mm. it's going to be hard to contain that. Okay. Okay. So following that, uh, you talked a lot about geopolitical, a little bit about geopolitical power balance and a common debate on my channel over the last six months. I guess the question has been, okay, so the United States dominated the 20th century, who will dominate the 21st? And most will land on uh, either the United States empire is still in its adolescence and it's going through some growing pains. But in fact, this is early days. The second answer is typically no power is shifting to the east. Uh, do you see one or the other more probable? Did you hear more sentiment leaning one or the other direction in Denver uh, last week? Or does either narrative resonate more with you, Ronnie? Well, Jay, I have to say I don't have a, a very strong educated view on that yeah I, sure. I i really really have to say but just from 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 my feeling and from from conversations uh, as we also published uh, the in gold we trust report in china every time i'm in china every time i'm in in singapore um i'm 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 i'm, I'm really excited about what's going on and and how quickly um this part of the world is developing and 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 in china for example they, they aren't copycats uh, uh uh, they are now really when it comes to technology i think they're they're really doing a great job i think their education system is is fantastic i think their um uh their students uh they've got students in the in the in the more important um um uh, um how do you say subjects um okay. I, I don't think that gender studies will really um 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 uh, a ba in gender studies and whatever will really mm. um make the the economy um uh, much Imperative. better right <laughs> yeah I, I so 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 i think you know um talking to chinese people to to chinese businessmen it is really astonishing how how motivated they are how hard working they are um so so from my point of view it it, it is also a, a long process i don't think that there's going to be one point in time when china is now ruling the world but you know we're we're seeing that china is really picking up um in all different parts uh when it comes to the economy uh, uh obviously when it comes to uh, uh uh technology military whatever um i think both systems have got their 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 issues their flaws um but i think the us is now kind of realizing that um there's there's strong competition coming up and at some point i don't know uh, if we study history um that that might become um a, a real concern i hope that we won't see any um any military escalations um if you understand china i think they they weren't really uh, aggressors um invading other countries but but for example, you know Taiwan. If you talk to uh, to to mainland Chinese, Taiwan is a part of China, and and there is no no question about that. Many of my Chinese contacts tell me, well, um, at some point it's gonna happen, perhaps um, after the the the, uh, the Winter Olympics next year. I don't know um, how will the U.S. react then um, if it's really shifting to a um, to a policy that is.
is that is focusing on the US and 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 and, and doesn't play you know world police anymore. It's going to be interesting to watch, but I think, you know, it's it's not black and white. Uh, it is um, much more nuanced and 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 therefore it's 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 very interesting to to to, to follow, obviously. OK, um, so follow up question on China, then Evergrande has been dominating headlines if, for context. Today is September 22nd. So whenever you're viewing this, is this uh, is this early days? Is this uh, uh, an early trigger point of some larger events that are going to carry on and this will become the systemic um, event that some fear it might be? Or is this bit of hype, bit of fear? Most of the debt holders are in China. It's not as systemic as people think. And, you know, in two weeks, we'll probably have moved on. What do you think, Ronnie? Well, well, the thing is, you know, many people say it's a, it's a Lehman moment. Uh, it is not because it's a, it's a government controlled demolition demolition uh, that doesn't make it any better but i think you know if if you have a look at <coughs> sorry what what happened um uh, in china recently you know we, we we saw that um china has really shown willingness to crack down on selected uh industries like you know the dd this ride share company uh we saw it with tech companies like tencent and alibaba we saw it with the online education and the video gaming sector so perhaps evergrande will be the 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 poster child of deleveraging and reforming the real estate sector that that's the plan on the other hand obviously um it is a deflationary uh driver i think that the bank of china will have to return to a much more dovish stance to contain any collateral damage and and the problem is of course we all don't know what what's going to happen to other real estate developers we don't know um how negatively affected the chinese uh economic activity will be we 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 have seen obviously that the 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 china's uh credit impulse has slowed recently to the lowest level since february uh we saw that uh the manufacturing pmi and also the non-manufacturing PMI both fell into contraction already in August and I think we're just seeing that 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 liquidity um, conditions at the margin have clearly turned uh, less favorable and the big question obviously is how much contagion uh, we will see um, if there's gonna be a dominant domino effect to other real estate developers in China and then of course uh, to the highly levered Chinese banking system from mm. my point of view you know it's it's also some sort of a uh, of an excuse for market participants for you know taking chips off the table reducing beta and 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 de-risking their portfolio we all know that you know we just went from one all-time high to another we all knew that that uh, uh it's uh it's already um at quite lofty value valuation so so from my point of view over the next couple of weeks we will see more volatility i think we will see much more downside side risk but it's not only china it's also economic numbers coming out in the in the us we're seeing uh gdp now for example by the atlanta fed basically coming in 50 percent lower than initially expected uh morning stanley has slashed its forecast so so you know this this environment where everything is priced to perfection now this this seems to be kind of over for now at least okay so then uh Final, where I'd love to wrap up here, where I always love to wrap up is, is uh, where should I be putting my money, Ronnie? That's the purpose of this whole channel. But my question for you isn't that. My question for you is, uh, what's the most valuable asset right now to be holding? And you can say cash. Cash is, is often my favorite uh, to have the dry powder and the ability and confidence to act. But, but uh, where in your portfolio do you feel like you have the most upside potential or the most opportunity right now? Well, of course, it, it depends on the time frame. Um, but I think at the moment, it, it re I, I like the technical setup in in gold. I think it's 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 really stabilizing here. And I always said it's it's gold that moves first, and then the rest of the commodity complex moving. And and I thought, and I think we we really saw it in 2020. We we saw it in 2008, 2009 when gold made 
made the bottom first and actually started rallying while the rest of the um, uh, inflation sensitives and the commodity complex only um, followed a couple of weeks later. Um, so, so gold, obviously, um, but still mining stocks, we talked about them, um, seeing tremendous, tremendous value in this um, space um in the large caps also in the royalty space but especially in the developer space um i like bitcoin um um although it's a it's a very very controversial topic from from my point of view gold and bitcoin they, they aren't enemies um i think it it fits together in a in a portfolio you know with gold having a track record of more than five thousand uh, uh years um preserving purchasing power and bitcoin obviously significantly less therefore higher volatility but therefore also significantly higher um uh, risk reward uh, we like it we like the combination we like the volatility we we, we are using it and and then i think in we, we're seeing tremendous level uh, 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 value also in the space of, of energy um, producers. Um, my friend Kevin Muir, he, he, he put out a great piece where he basically uh, compared um, um, uh, energy producers to, to tobacco stocks, which were fantastic performance because they were basically kicked out from institutional uh, portfolios uh, in the 90s. Um, they, they they are paying out very, very high um, uh, dividends. If you have a look at, for example, Philip Morris or now Altria, um, they massively outperformed the S&P. And I think now at the moment with um, uh, oil prices at that level and from my point of view going higher, I think um, energy companies are a steal, and I think that's for a longer term uh, investor. I think it's that's that's really um, stocks that you can just you know buy and hold over the next couple of years. Yeah, I love that. I I'm inclined to agree with you on the energy front, acknowledging that it's a sector I know very little about. So one, I need to study more because I don't feel like I have the conviction to act on any ideas just yet. But uh, from from a high level standpoint, I'm excited by what I see. And uh, interesting to hear you say uh, Bitcoin. It's still controversial, you know, from your standpoint. And then I understand why. And uh, I also I've always appreciated you because you hold both in your funds right and you don't get caught up in what i honestly want to call like kind of fanboy uh issues right like if you become a fan of an asset you might get yourself in trouble right it's like a recipe to get blindsided if you love gold if you love bitcoin if you love equities like never fall in love with the asset right then you, you join the team it becomes us versus them arguments and it's illogical right because I mean, I get it and it's, you can draw parallels, obviously, but I've always felt that comparing gold to Bitcoin is kind of like comparing real estate to Facebook stock. Like they're just different, right? And they each serve their own purpose. And yes, you can draw parallels. Doesn't mean you have to though, right? And one doesn't uh, dismiss the other. My thoughts anyways, what do you think? Well, well yeah, I, I compared it to, um, you know, a large and, and, and safe Volvo SUV. Um, and uh, a motorcycle, a Ducati Panigale. You know, okay. you can go from A to B with both. Um, of course, it's it's much more, much more comfortable and safer in in a large SUV for the family, and it's perhaps more fun uh, on a motorcycle. And you're faster um, wherever you want to go to. But as soon as it starts raining, and we're seeing now, you know, Bitcoin seems to be a risk on uh, asset as for now at least. Yeah. Mm. Um, this 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 volatility is kicking in but but i agree you know i'm i'm for me bitcoin isn't a religion gold isn't a religion i think it's just two things that cannot be inflated at will where we see um relative scarcity compared to fiat money uh i think both should have a a a, a place in your portfolio but obviously as as bitcoin is still so much more volatile um if it's too volatile for you then just take a lower percentage in your portfolio yeah that, that's that's basically the the right approach and and if you can't sleep because of the volatility then perhaps it isn't for you mm. um 
but I think you know what what really fascinates me, Jay, is the the dynamic in the whole space. Uh, I'm seeing lots of brilliant minds, uh, hardworking, smart people that really want to to change something for the better. Of course, they also want to make money. But I think I'm I'm I'm, I'm sometimes you know attending those those conferences and events. I'm really astonished uh, about the the quality of people attending. And and I have to say, when you go to a traditional fun financial banking whatever conference um it's sometimes the opposite where where people are only talking about the the threats and the problems and you know regulation and higher taxes and whatever but nobody's talking about opportunities and mm. and, and possibilities and you know uh new business models new ideas and stuff like that so so for me it's very refreshing also you know i'm not that old yet but it's it's just cool to talk to 25 year old kids and and perhaps they are learning from the conversation but i'm also learning quite a lot talking to them about the technology i love that i love that okay we'll, we'll wrap it up there um i'm gonna just throw it out there one more time we're hosting the vancouver resource investment conference on january 16th and 17th 17th and fingers crossed ronnie is going to be there uh travel restrictions pending but it's going to be yeah. awesome. It's going to be super yeah. fun. I'd love to have you there, man. Mr. Trudeau has to sign probably my national interest <laughs> <Yeah>. exemption. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> Hilarious. But I'll, I'll try my best. I, I really look forward to this. Okay. Thanks sounds good. Th me. Thanks again for coming on. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Jay. All the best and take care. Bye bye. All right. Okay, guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But co coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.